Book three, chapter nine of Strangers and Pilgrims by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Strangers and Pilgrims, Book three, chapter nine. My God, I never knew what the mad felt before, for I am mad beyond all doubt. No, I am dead. These putrefying limbs shut round and sepulchre the panting soul, which would burst forth into the wandering air. What hideous thought was that I had in no? Tis gone, and yet its burden remains here, o'er these dull eyes, upon this weary heart. O oh world, O oh life, O oh day, O oh misery! She is the madhouse nurse who tends on me. It is a piteous office. Whether a careful compliance with Mr. Ford's behest would have saved Elizabeth from the evil consequences of that one wet day, it is impossible to say. She took no precautions. She was utterly reckless of her own safety, hating doctors and all medical appliances with a childish hatred, and never from her childhood upwards having cared to take any trouble about herself in the way of preserving her health. That health had hitherto been a splendid inheritance, which recklessness would hardly reduce. She had run wild in the Devonian woods, wet-footed, and caring no more for the damps of morass or brooklet than a young fawn. She had roamed the moor in the very teeth of the east wind, had lingered latest of all the household in the vicarage garden, when the heavy night dews were falling. She had sat up late into the nights, reading her favourite books, had existed for weeks at a time with the least possible allowance of sleep, and had hardly known what it was to be ill. "'I almost wish I could set up a chronic headache like Diana's,' she used to say in those days. "'It is so convenient occasionally.' But after her boy's death had come an illness which concentrated into nine long weeks of anguish, more than some feeble souls suffer in a lifetime of weak murmurings and complainings. Brain fever, it would have been most likely called, had the patient been any one else than Lord Paulyn's wife. But the specialists, who met three times a week in solemn conclave to discuss the diagnostics of the case, found occult names for the ailments of a person of quality. That nameless fever of mind and body, engendered of a wild and desperate grief, came and passed away, but not without severely trying the strength of the mind which had been the greater sufferer. The inexhaustible riches of a superb constitution saved the body, but that weaker vessel the mind foundered, and at one time was menaced with total shipwreck. Now fever again took possession of that lovely temple, the lowest form of contagious fever, and rang its dismal changes from gastric to typhus, from typhus to typhoid. Wet garments, tainted air, did their fatal work. After a week or so of general depression, occasional shivering fits, utter want of appetite, and continued sleeplessness, the fever fiend revealed himself in a more definite form, and the local surgeon, resident five miles from the chateau, declared with infinite hesitation and unwillingness that in his opinion Lady Paulyn was suffering from a mild form, a very mild form and entirely without danger, of the low fever that had been hanging about the neighbourhood this year. This declaration was made in the most cautious and conciliating manner to Lady Paulyn herself, in the presence of Hilda Disney. The disagreeable fact disguised with an excessive show of confidence and hopefulness on the doctor's part, just as he contrived to conceal the flavour of aloes or rhubarb in his silvered pills. Elizabeth turned her haggard, fever-bright eyes to him with a strange look, she had been sitting in a moody attitude till now, staring fixedly at the ground. "'I have had fever before,' she said, and that time my mind went. I could not believe it for long afterwards, but I know now that it did go. I hope that's not going to happen to me again.' "'My dear lady,' Elizabeth shuddered. The specialist, or in other words, mad doctors, had always called her dear lady.' there is not the smallest cause for such an apprehension in fever there is occasionally a slight delirium purely attributable to physical causes but i trust that with care there may be nothing of the kind in your case with care 
repeated elizabeth yes i remember they said that when i was ill before i heard them as i lay there helpless repeating the same words every day like parrots but then i only wanted to die and to go to my darling and i don't know that it matters much more now only i don't want to lose my mind and yet go on living if i am to die young let me die altogether not like dean swift first atop the scotch surgeon an eminently practical man shook his head a little at this with a grave side glance at miss disney and then murmured his directions quiet repose the saline draughts which he would alter a little from those of yesterday and the day before and above all care it would be as well to send to glasgow for a professional nurse lest the duties of the sick-room might be beyond the scope of miss disney or lady paulyn's maid this was mentioned in confidence to hilda when she and the surgeon had left elizabeth's room together it is not going to be serious i hope said hilda oh i apprehend not no i venture to think not with youth and so fine a constitution no organic disease i have every reason to imagine the fever will pass off in a few days and a complete restoration ensue but the want of sleep and of appetite are unpleasant symptoms and her ladyship's mind is more excited than i should wish i think as it is a case which will no doubt inspire some anxiety in the mind of lord paulyn and as he is absent from home it might be wise to fortify ourselves with a second opinion this was said with an air of proud humility as who should say i feel myself strong enough to cope with the diseases of a nation but usage must be observed according to the statute in such case made and provided for medicine has its unwritten laws its unregistered acts of an intangible parliament i should like dr socky hall to see lady paulyn oh pray telegraph to him at once said hilda anxiously and i will telegraph to my cousin with this understanding they parted the doctor to drive his neat gig to the little bathing place five miles off whence he could send a telegram to glasgow hilda to pace the terrace under a grey autumn sky watching or seeming to watch the white rain mist rolling up from the mountain crests and meditating this new turn in affairs how would reginald take his wife's illness they had parted with a palpable coolness on her part indifference and smothered anger on his would all his old selfish vehement love rush back upon him with redoubled force if he found his wife in jeopardy such hours of peril as it were the shadow of the destroyer lurking on the threshold of a half-open door are apt to waken dormant affections to rekindle passions that seem dead as death itself i know that he loves her still thought hilda those flashes of anger spring from the same root as tender looks and sweet words he loves her still with quite as much real affection and as near an approach to unselfishness as he is capable of feeling and if she were to die he would never love any one else would marry again perhaps but for money no doubt the second time and i well i should always be in the same position a miserable hanger-on outside his life god give me patience to do my duty to both of them to the man who amused a summer holiday by breaking my heart and the woman who has usurped my place in the world to communicate by telegraph or post with lord paulyn was no easy matter or there was at least small security that a telegram would find him his address was fugitive at newmarket to-day on board his yacht in southampton water bound for havre to-morrow hilda telegraphed to newmarket and park lane trusting that one of the two messages might reach him without delay she also wrote him a letter addressed to park lane in which she gave him a careful account of elizabeth's symptoms and the medical man's remarks upon them having done this she felt that she had done her duty and could abide the issue of events with a complacent mind but a harder and more painful duty remained to be done the patient had to be watched and cared for and that task miss disney deemed herself in a manner bound to perform a horrible restlessness had taken possession of elizabeth 
weak as she was she wanted to roam from room to room out on to the lonely walk even under the dull grey sky and mr mcknockie the local surgeon had especially directed that she should be kept in perfect quiet and in her own room that she should straightway take to her bed indeed and as it were prostrate herself at the feet of the fever fiend against this elizabeth protested with all her might declaring that she was not ill that she had nothing the matter with her but cold and sore throat and mr mcknockie was only trying how long a bill he could run up with his vapid tasteless medicines air fresh air was all she required she cried and she flung open the french window and went out into the balcony in spite of hilda oh see 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 she cried looking away toward that opening in the hills where the waters widened out into ocean oh if you would only carry me away to some new world a world of dreams and shadows where i should have done with the burden of life alas she was only too near that world of dreams and shadows before nightfall she was delirious watched over by hired nurses a prostrate wretch concerning whom the doctors socky hall and mcknockie shook their heads almost despondently fever of mind and body raged together with unabating violence she had entered the region of dreams and shadows and in that long delirium during which all things in the present were blotted out or only seen dimly athwart a thick cloud her mind went back to the past she was a child again following the windings of the tabor or losing herself in the wood where the anemones were like snow in april she was a girl again her childish unspoken love for malcolm ford ripening slowly like a bud that ripens to a blossom under a gentle english sun until it burst into bloom and beauty the perfect flower of a woman's heart in that drama of the past which she lived over again there were not only scenes that had been but scenes that had not been with the loss of sober reason and the perception of surrounding things invention was curiously quickened memory which was beyond measure vivid ran a race with imagination that brief span of her springtime courtship the few short weeks of her engagement to malcolm ford were spun out by innumerable fancies of the distracted brain she recalled walks that they had never walked long wanderings over the moor wild poetic talk the converse of spirits which had issued forth from the doors of this solid world into a vast cloudland a place of dim unfinished thoughts and broken fancies it was distracting to hear her talk of these things it was a madness almost maddening to watch or listen to the hired nurses made light enough of the business hauled their patient about with their coarse hands tied her even with bonds when she was too restless for their endurance ate drank slept and rejoiced while she lay there in her dream world entreating malcolm to loosen those cruel cords to take her away out of the stifling atmosphere that was killing her miss disney made a point of spending some hours of the day or night in the sick-room and in these hours elizabeth fared a little better than at other times the tying process was at any rate not attempted in hilda's presence but consciousness of all immediate events being in abeyance the hapless patient knew not that she was being protected by this quiet figure in a black silk gown which sat statue-like by the hearth and she was exceedingly tormented by the sight of it in her more desperate moods she even accused miss disney of keeping her a prisoner in that horrible room and separating her from her plighted lover here was one of the mental obliquities which made a part of her disorder her husband and her married life even her lost child were forgotten were as things that had never been nothing stood between her and her first lover except the bondage that kept her to that hated room he was at all times close at hand waiting for her calling to her even only she could not go to him every creature who held her back from him was her enemy and chief among these the despotic mistress of her prison-house the arbiter of her fate was hilda disney matters were in this state when lord paulyn came back to slogner dyack tardily apprised of his wife's illness by the telegrams which had followed him from stage to stage of his wandering existence 
he found the doctors at sea only able to give stately utterance to the feeblest opinions but by a curious fatality issuing orders which in every minutest detail were opposed to the desires of the patient in her more lucid intervals she had languished for the sight of old faces the sound of old voices she had entreated them to send for the old servant who had nursed her the old vicarage servant who had been part and parcel of her home in the happy childish days before her mother's death before she had begun to be proud of her beauty and to grow indifferent to the commonplace present in selfish dreams of a much brighter future she spoke of the woman by her name remembering all about her with a singular precision at which the doctors looked at each other and wondered memory extraordinarily clear they remarked like heaven-gifted seers divining a fact which it was not within the power of common perception to discover then came a longing for her sisters above all for blanche the young frivolous creature who had loved her better than she had ever loved in return piteously in her most reasonable moments she implored that blanche might be summoned she would amuse me she said and i want so much to be amused all is so dull here such an awful quiet like a house under a spell oh for heaven's sake if there is any one in this place who loves me or pities me let them send for my sister blanche miss disney faithful to her duties in a semi-mechanical way informed the medical men of this wish would it not be well to send for miss luttrell oh no they said isolation perfect isolation offered the only chance of recovery lady paulyn was to see no one except the persons who nursed her no old familiar faces inspiring violent emotions agitating thoughts were to approach her even miss disney who might be permitted to take her turn occasionally in the patient's room must be careful not to talk to her not to encourage anything like conversation soothing silence must pervade the chamber sepulchral as the room where the mighty dead lie in state when lord paulyn came he might see his wife but with such precautions as must reduce any meeting between them to a nullity the dismal monotony of a sick-room was to be elizabeth's cure the hard cruel visages of hireling nurses were to woo her back to reason and peace so said dr socky hall mr macknockie as in duty bound agreeing lord paulyn came at a time when mere bodily illness had been well nigh subjugated and that nicer mechanism the mind alone remained out of gear he was allowed to stand for a few minutes in the shadow of the curtains that draped his wife's bed and having the misfortune to come in an unlucky hour heard her rave about her first lover and upbraid the tyrants who had severed them he turned upon his heel and left the room without a word nor did he enter again until upon a terrible occasion some weeks later when the malady had increased even under those favourable circumstances of utter isolation and the care of hireling nurses and he was summoned to his wife's room to prevent her flinging herself out of the window by the sheer force of his strong arm she was clinging to the long french window when he went into the room an awful white-robed figure with streaming hair and flashing passionate eyes the two nurses trying to drag her back but vainly striving against the unnatural strength that waits upon a mind distraught why do you keep me back from him she cried he's down yonder by the water waiting for me as he has waited always i heard his voice just now you shall not keep me back do you think i'm afraid of the danger at the worst it is only death let me go lord paulyn's strong arm thrust the nurses aside and grasped the frail figure whose convulsive force was strangled in that muscular grip she struggled with him and was hurt in the struggle hurt by the grasp of that broad hand which seemed so brutal in its strength she looked at him with her wild fever-bright eyes i know you now she said you were my husband the other was a sweet sad dream you are the bitter reality 
he flung her into the arms of the head nurse, a virago six feet high. "'If you cannot take better care of your patient, I must have her put where they will know how to look after her, without boring me,' he said, and left the room, without another look at the only woman he had ever loved. There are some flames that burn themselves out very soon, the fierce love of selfish souls among them. The warmth of Lord Paulyn's affection for his wife had long been on the wane. Her extravagances had tried his temper, touching him deeply where he was most susceptible, in his love of money. Her illness had annoyed him, for he detested the fuss and trouble of domestic affliction. This second calamity struck a final blow to his self-love, with which was bound up whatever yet remained of that other love that her wandering mind should set up that parson fellow in his rightful place should erase him reginald paulyn from the story of her life harking back to that old foolish sentimental story of her girlhood was too deep an offence he sat by his lonely hearth and brooded over his wrongs his wife's base ingratitude his childlessness hardly daring to look forward to the future in which he saw the creature he had once loved menaced with the direst affliction humanity can suffer. He summoned the mad doctors, the men who had taken out a kind of patent for the manipulation of the distraught mind, the men who had called Elizabeth dear lady a year ago in Park Lane. They came and agreed in polite language, which shirked the actual word, that Lady Paulyn was very mad they feared hopelessly permanently mad nature of course had vast resources they added sagely providing for the event of her recovery there was no knowing what healing balm she might ultimately produce from her inexhaustible storehouse but in the meantime there could be no doubt of the main fact that her ladyship was suffering from acute mania and must be placed under fitting restraint there was a little discussion as to which of the doctors should have the privilege of ministering to this amiable sufferer. One had a charming place, an old-fashioned mansion of the Grange Order in Surrey, the other a handsome establishment on the north side of London. They debated this little matter between themselves, like polite vultures haggling about a piece of carrion, perhaps drew lots for the patient, and finally arranged everything with an air of agreeable cordiality the physician whose house was in the north had won the day you must contrive to get me through any formalities that may be necessary as easily as you can said lord paulyn it's a horrible business and the sooner it's over the better poor thing she was the loveliest woman in england bar none when i married her i feel as if we were committing a murder oh be assured my dear sir that the dear lady could not be more happily placed than with our good friend dr cameron said dr turnham the gentleman who had resigned the prey to his brother patentee if skill and care can restore her rely upon it they will not be wanting the viscount sighed and went back to his solitary smoking-room breathing muttered curses against destiny she had worn out his love, but to think of her handed over to this doctor, consigned perhaps to a life-long imprisonment, that was hard. What should he do with himself, when she who had made the glory of his life was walled up in that living grave? He had Newmarket still, and his stables, and at his best he had given more of his life to the stable than to Elizabeth. But he felt not the less that his life was broken that he could never again be the man that he had been, that even the hoarse roar of the ring and the public when his colours came to the front in a great race would henceforth fall flat upon his ear. End of Book 3 Chapter 9book three chapter ten of Strangers and Pilgrims by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Strangers and Pilgrims, Book 3, Chapter 10 Yes, it was love. 
if thoughts of tenderness tried in temptation strongest by distress unmoved by absence firm in every clime and yet oh more than all untired by time which naught removed nor menaced to remove if there be love in mortals this was love a gloom fell upon the spirit of malcolm ford after that meeting in the sick woman's cottage the thoughts of his old life his old hopes bright dreams of union with the woman he fondly loved pleasant visions of a simple pastoral english life among people it would be his happiness to render happy a fair prospect which he had cherished for a little while only to lose it by and by in bitterness and disappointment the thoughts of these things came back to him and took the sweetness out of his pleasant existence and made all the future barren it was hard to know that he had his own impetuosity to blame for the ruin of his earthly happiness harder to be content remembering how he had been permitted to realise that other and unselfish dream of carrying light to those that sat in darkness hard to say lord i thank thee thou knowest best what is good for me thou hast given me far more than i deserve not yet could his spirit soar into this holy region of perpetual peace a region where sorrows are not only mild chastenings of a heavenly master who leavens every affliction with the leaven of faith and hope his thoughts were of the earth earthy his mind went back to that day in eton place and he hated himself for his unreasoning anger for the false pride which would not let him court an explanation for his blind passion which had taken the show of things for their reality he thought of what might have been if instead of casting away this flower of his life on the first indignant impulse of his jealous mind he had shown a little patience a little tenderness but he had seemed incapable of patience on that odious day with his own angry foot he had kicked down the air-built castle which it had been so sweet to him to raise if he had found her happy serene in the glory of her high position secure in the sympathy and affection of a worthy husband he would not have felt his own loss so keenly he could have borne even to know that she had never loved him better than in that luckless hour when he renounced her but to know that her life had been shipwrecked by his mad anger to look into her haggard face with its sad mocking smile and know that she was miserable to read the old love in those lovely eyes the old love cherished always confessed too late by unconscious looks that pierced his very soul these things were indeed bitter for a while he forgot his profession forgot what he was and the work that still remained for him to do sank from his lofty level of self-renouncement to the lowest depths of a too human despair if the image of his lost love had haunted him in that strange romantic world amid the waters of the pacific how much more did that sad shade pursue him now when the woman he still loved was near at hand when from the hillside which he had daily need to pass he could see the white walls of the house she had called her prison never more might his eyes search the secrets of that altered face the face which he remembered in all the pride of its girlish beauty never any more might those two meet to all other world-weary souls he might carry consolation might breathe words of promise and of hope but not to her between them rose the barrier of a mighty love unconquered and unconquerable he went his quiet way with that great sorrow in his heart had he not carried almost as great a sorrow even in the islands of the southern sea only that he had then regarded his loss as inevitable while he now lamented it as the wretched fruit of his own fatuity he went his quiet way and did the little there was to be done in that scantily peopled district visited the sick comforted the dying but the work he did just now was done in a semi-mechanical way for his heart was elsewhither it would have been a relief to him if he could only have heard of her if there had been any one who could tell him how she fared he looked at the white walls the conical towers longingly yet would not go near them to enter there would be to enter the gates of hell but he would have risked much to hear of her 
his eyes searched the little chapel at every service but saw her not yet this might augur nothing except that she instinctively avoided him with an avoidance he must needs approve weeks passed and he heard nothing and that mountain scene seemed strangely blank to him as if that one figure met only once had filled the whole landscape then came a day on which duty took him near slogner dyack he went to see a sick child in a cottage within half a mile of the chateau and here almost by accident he first heard of lady paulyn's illness he had asked the boy's mother if she had everything necessary for him everything the doctor had ordered oh yes she told him they got everything from the big house where the poor lady was so ill he had been bending tenderly over the fever-stricken child but he looked suddenly upward at these words what house what lady he asked quickly oh the house with the peaky lums the woman answered a lady paulyn who took the fever and is lying ill with it still near death some folks say he laid the sick boy gently down upon his pillow and then questioned the woman closely she could tell him no more than she had told him in that one sentence the lady at slogner dyack had been dangerously ill the doctors came there every day a doctor from glasgow and another doctor from ellensbridge some said she was dying but she had lain sick so long and hadn't died so there was hopes of her getting well the fever had been quicker with poor bodies like herself it was a good many weeks now since lady paulyn had been took what could he do he left the cottage and walked straight to slogner dyack with no definite idea as to what he should do only that he would at least discover for himself how far the woman at the cottage had been right those people always exaggerate pick up wild versions of common facts elizabeth might have been ill perhaps oh, but not dangerously he tried to persuade himself this as he walked swiftly along the misty road he did not stop to consider his right or want of right to approach her such an hour as this made an end to all such questions if she were dying it was his duty to be near her to sustain that poor weak soul of whose mystery he knew more than any other man on earth by his right as a minister of god's word and her dead father's friend he would claim the privilege of being near her at the last dark hour the land in front of the chateau looked grey and gloomy in the twilight the darkness only broken by the red light of a wood fire in the hall a pompous butler imported from park lane and sorely averse to this northern establishment was basking in a glastonbury chair before the cavernous fireplace yesterday's times lying across his knees today's scotsman and edinburgh daily review crumpled into the corner of the chair the seneschal having dropped comfortably off to sleep after exhausting the news of the day disturbed by the entrance of malcolm ford this functionary rose from his slumbers and imperiously commanded an underling to light the gas which is about the only convenience we have in this detestable barracks of a place he was wont to say and have to make it ourselves in a kitchen garden at the risk of being blowed out of our beds questioned by mr ford this personage affirmed that lady paulyn was ill very ill oh but not in any danger she had been in danger three weeks ago when the fever was at its height but there was no danger now yet you say she is still very ill oh very ill sir at least way she keeps her own room oh but is i believe progressing towards convalescence would you wish to see miss disney sir lord paulyn have gone to hinverness for a few days deer stalking uh, but miss disney is at home uh, no if you can assure me that lady paulyn is out of danger i need not trouble miss disney but in the event of danger i should be very glad if that lady would send for me you can give her my card i'm an old friend of lady paulyn's family he gave the butler his card and went away relieved but still uneasy how gloomy the house looked the dark oak staircase with its mediaeval newels the scottish lion rampant supporting the shield of the knife powder manufacturer whose conventional quarterings lord paulyn had not taken the trouble to efface 
the vaulted roof with its bosses and corbels in carton pierre and gloomy as the ancient woodwork from which they had been modelled the black and white marble floor with skins of savage beasts laid here and there the suits of mail glimmering in the firelight the underling not yet having brought his taper a dismal udolpho like place it looked at this hour in spite of the chief butler's portly presence hmm. a parson i suppose mused the butler when the figure of malcolm ford had vanished from the porch beneath whose shadow he had lingered a few moments to look back into the house wondering whether amidst all this pomp she was loved and well cared for a parson i make no doubt what a rum lot they are to be sure as bad as ravens hanging about a house when there's any one dying one would think they went partners with the undertaker well let's have a look at his pasteboard he continued aloud while the gas was being lighted the reverend malcolm ford why i'm blessed if that isn't the chap she was engaged to before we married her fancy his coming airy a sneaking here while his lordship's out of the way for about a fortnight after that evening mr ford sent a messenger to slogner dyack at intervals of two or three days to inquire about lady paulyn and the reply being always to the effect that her ladyship was progressing favourably he comforted himself with the idea that all danger was past and finally told the messenger he need go no more his own residence at dunallen was drawing to a close mr mackenzie writing cheerily from divers belgian towns where he and his family were enjoying the glories and pleasures of continental travel on an economical scale but writing still more cheerily of his approaching return to the home nest after all my dear ford there's no place like our own wee parlour and there's nothing in the way of foreign kickshaws partridges with stewed pears and the lord knows what that i relish as much as a sheep's head or a few broths and i think my wife's potato soup beats your potage a l'italienne or your puree au pois hollow the hills about spa are a poor business compared with argyleshire and if it wasn't for being covered with furs would be paltry beyond comparison as it doesn't do for a white choker to adorn the gaming table i had rather a dull time of it and was glad when we got back to liege where the churches and gun factories are unapproachable i saw some wood carving about the choir stalls that would have set your ritualistic mouth watering <laughs> only that now you've given yourself up to foreign missions you've turned your back on that kind of thing malcolm ford's time at dunallen was nearly ended thank god the peril had passed he could leave her with a heart that was almost at peace for by this time he had schooled himself to accept his fate the lot out of god's hand and to pray in humility and hope for her ultimate happiness thus came the last day but one of his service at dunallen he had been at work from early in the morning going from dwelling to dwelling dwellings which were chiefly of the cottage order taking leave of people to whom he had made himself dear in the short space of his ministration among them promising to remember them at the other end of the world in compliance with their desire that he would sometimes think of them when he was far away he answered them with a somewhat mournful smile thinking of that other memory which would cleave to him for the rest of his life there was weeping and wailing in all these humble habitations at the prospect of his departure oh mr mackenzie was a good man and a kind one they all protested warmly and mrs mackenzie's potato soup and honest barley broth kept soul and body together in many a household through the bleak long winter but mr mackenzie wasn't like mr ford he had a little dry way of talking to folks and didn't enter into the very thoughts of poor bodies like his substitute nor could he preach so fine a sermon as mr ford a strong point with these critical caledonians his day's labours were ended at last he had trodden the heather-clad hills he loved so well for the last time had taken his last look at slogner dyack's white towers and he sat by his solitary hearth thinking how very soon he should have left this well-known land to resume his work among a strange people 
not unhopefully did he look forward to new toil new anxieties the eager thirst of conquest which urges the missionary as it urges the warrior had grown somewhat languid with him of late he could not feel quite the old enthusiasm i go to reclaim the lost among a strange people he thought while the soul that i love best on earth may be perishing the soul that i might have trained to such a high destiny he had letters to write much still to do before leaving scotland but he sat by the lonely fireside in the gloaming lost in melancholy thought the neat little maid-servant came to ask if she should bring the lamp but he told her no he liked the firelight it is a pleasant light for thinking by meg he said a pleasant light perhaps but his thoughts were not pleasant he tried to confine them to the actual business of his life the work that lay before him in the future but they would not be directed they clung with a passionate regret to the scene he was about to leave they hung about the white-walled chateau they wandered in and out of those unknown chambers where elizabeth lived they would not be diverted from her oh if she were well and happy it would be different he said to himself in self-exculpation he sat on till the chapel clock had struck nine the october night was blusterous wild gusts rattling the window frames and rustling the ivy with a gruesome and ghostly sound as of disembodied souls striving for admittance the moon was up and by fits and starts emerged from a stormy sea of blackest clouds lighting up the wild landscape the water at the foot of the hill it was during one of these sudden bursts of moonlight that mr ford happening suddenly to look up saw a strange figure outside his window a face white as the moonlight peering in at him through the glass for a moment he looked at it in dumb wonder taking it for the embodiment of his own troubled fancies a mere visionary creature as if that melancholy sound of the ivy leaves against the glass had made itself a shape out of the shadows it was very real however a hand tapped upon the pane with a hurried imperious tapping he got up from his chair and went over to the window great heavens it was that one woman whose image absorbed his every thought it was elizabeth oh, let me in she cried piteously in tones that seemed strange to him stranger even than her presence in that spot he opened the window softly i'll come round to the door and let you in he said for heaven's sake what has happened oh, only that i've cheated them all at last she said looking at him with wild beseeching eyes i have broken loose from my bondage oh malcolm you will not let them take me back again something an unutterable indefinable something in her tones and looks struck him with a sharper pain than he had felt even yet though almost all his thoughts of her had been pain he rushed across the room and the tiny hall beyond it to the door only a few paces from the window by which she stood he opened it quickly and went out into the wintry night and found her still rapping impatiently upon the pane as if she had not heard or comprehended what he had said to her she was clad in some loose long garment of the dressing-gown species and had a shawl flung carelessly over her shoulders but neither hat nor bonnet her long rippling hair fell loosely about her mixed with the folds of her shawl dear lady paulyn he said very gently what could have induced you to come here at such an hour good heavens you have surely not walked he added hastily looking down the long moonlit road where there was no vestige of any vehicle oh yes i have come all the way on foot and alone i was afraid at first i might not find you but there was some instinct led me right i think sometimes i saw you a little way before me in the moonlight and you turned now and then and smiled and beckoned me oh, your smile drew me after you why do you live so far off malcolm you were so much nearer at hawley i remember that morning i came to see you only to find you gone it seemed so short a walk but to-night it was like walking on for ever and ever come into the house he said in a curious half-muffled voice a deadly fear rending his heart 
Come into the warm room, Elizabeth. You're shivering. Oh, not with cold, she said hastily. With fear. Fear? Of what? That they'll follow me and take me away from you. They'll guess where I've come, you know, as you and I are engaged to be married. My horrible jailers will hunt me down, Malcolm. Hilda at their head. Hilda, who is the worst of all. Not rough and cruel with her hands like the others, but cruel with her cold, watchful eyes that are looking me into my grave. What was this? The delirium of fever? He had been told that the fever had passed, that she was almost well. They had deceived him, evidently. They denied his right to know what progress she made towards recovery or towards death. They had mocked him with their lying messages. He put her shawl around her and drew her into the house. He could keep her here long enough for her to rest and refresh herself, while a messenger went to Slogner Dyack to fetch a carriage to convey her home. This was obviously his duty. She had talked wildly of her jailers. She had entreated him not to deliver her up to them. And yet his first act must needs be in a manner to betray her. His duty was clearly to restore her into the hands of her friends. That wild horror of Hilda and of her nurses could but be the raving of delirium. They were doubtless kind enough in their way, even if it were not the kindest way, only hired service or the task-work imposed by duty. It was common for these poor, fever-distracted souls to exhibit a horror of their best friends, to fly from them even as she had fled. No, there was nothing for him to do but restore her to her own home, to that lonely pile which had seemed to him so darksome and gloomy a habitation that autumn twilight when he crossed its threshold for the first time. He led her into the parlour, where pine logs and sea-coal were burning cheerily, led her into the ruddy home-like light, her weary head resting on his shoulder, as it had never rested since the night when he asked her to be his wife, and let all the scheme of his existence drift away from him upon the flood-tide of passion. He placed her in the big easy-chair by the hearth, removed her shawl, damp with the night dew, and then planted himself by the opposite side of the mantelpiece, watching her with grave anxiety, thinking even in this sad moment how fair a picture she made in the firelight. A sad, forlorn face with troubled eyes, a listless figure half shrouded in a veil of golden-brown hair. If it were his duty, as he felt it was, to communicate with her friends, there was time enough to dispatch his messenger. He wanted her to speak a little more clearly first, to discover the full significance of her fear. She sat for some minutes in silence, staring absently at the fire, with a half-smile upon her face, as if exhausted by her long walk, and feeling a physical satisfaction in mere warmth and rest. And then, after what seemed to Malcolm a very long pause, she looked slowly round the room, still smiling, and this time with more meaning in her smile. "'Oh, how pretty your room looks in the firelight,' she said in her old light tone, which smote him to the heart at such a time. Oh, "'But your rooms are always pretty, with books and things, much prettier than my grand rooms, crowded with pictures and gilding and finery, and a hundred colours that make my eyes ache to look at them. I like this sober, brown-looking parlour, like an interior by Rembrandt. This is the first time I've been in any room of yours since I came to you that morning at Hawley. But we were not engaged to be married in those days, she added, smiling innocently up at him, as if she were saying the most reasonable, the most natural thing in the world. Our engagement he said gravely. That is an old song, and came to an end long ago. Let us talk of the future, Lady Paulyn, not of the past. She watched him as he spoke, with a curious look, as if she saw him talking without hearing what he'd said. It was before we were engaged, she went on, pursuing her own line of thought. How soon are we to be married, Malcolm? When we are married, you can take me away from that dreadful room, with a shudder. 
that horrid room where i lie awake night after night watching the candle burn slowly down oh how slowly it burns and the reflection of the flame in the shining oak panel it was clever of me to find out that about the candle wasn't it they took away my watch and got tired of telling me what o'clock it was or were too unkind to do it and then i thought of king alfred and the candles and knew by their burning when morning had nearly come he sighed a heart-broken sigh and sat down by her taking her hand gently dear lady paulyn he began with a stress upon the name i want to decide with your help what we had better do this long dreary walk must have tired you so much you have been very ill she turned upon him sharply with flashing eyes do not say that to me she cried angrily that is what all the doctors said dear lady you have been very ill talking to me in their soothing sugary tones as if they were reasoning with a baby in arms i told them that i was not ill that i was quite as well as i had ever been in my life only that i wanted to be let out of that hideous room to go out upon the hills to come to you malcolm with sudden tenderness and you see i was right she went on after a little pause if i were ill do you suppose i could have walked ever so many miles and i came along almost as fast as the wind i ran part of the way could i do that if i were ill malcolm he was silent for a few moments his head turned away from her and from the firelight his face quite hidden the first sound that broke the silence was a smothered sob she looked at him wonderingly malcolm why are you unhappy about me don't you understand that i am not ill oh, what does it matter to us if all those doctors talk nonsense you can send them all away when we're married elizabeth he said with tender earnestness taking her thin cold hand in his and holding it while he spoke alas there was no sign of bodily fever in that poor little hand it was that greater fever of the mind which he perceived here with supreme anguish elizabeth there is a kind of illness in which the mind is the chief sufferer an illness of which it seems to me the best means of cure are in the hands of the patient and not the doctor patience and resignation dear are the means of cure which god has given to us all if anything has made you unhappy if anything has disturbed your peace of mind pray to him for help for consolation and for cure they will come elizabeth believe me they will come she looked at him wonderingly for a few minutes as if there were something in his words that made her thoughtful he was the first person who had ever spoken to her of her mind who had ever boldly told her that all was not well there the doctors had simpered at her and tut-tutted and patted her gently on the head as if she had suddenly gone backward in years and become a child of two they had made pretty little affectionate speeches of a sugar-plum fashion never giving her a direct answer to her eager questions putting off everything blandly till to-morrow till she began to think the order of the universe was changed and time was all to-morrow and then they left her to lie on her bed and wander from dawn to sunset from night till morning and to weave strange romances in her ever-working brain for lack of any reality in her life except the horrible reality of the room she hated and the nurses who ill-used her but this was part and parcel of the magical process of isolation whereby she was to recover her wits there's nothing the matter with my mind she said what should there be the matter now that i am with you and happy there never was anything the matter with me except the silent horror of that room and those rough-handed women who stared at me and worried me from morning till night with medicines and messes jellies and beef teas and things making believe that i was ill oh, but you won't give me back to them you won't let them take me away from you promise me that malcolm oh mind you must promise me that half rising from her chair and clinging to him 
my dearest do not ask me to make an impossible promise i have no alternative it is my duty to restore you to your friends you cannot remain here and where can you so properly be as in your own house try to think elizabeth what the world would say if it knew that you wished to leave your husband and your own proper home my husband she repeated with a cold laugh my husband oh, that is what hilda said to me one day the nurses talk of my delusions why there can be no delusion so wild as that as if i could have any other husband than you malcolm after that night in the vicarage garden when i almost asked you to marry me my husband go back to my husband go away from you to my husband oh, what malcolm are you going to talk nonsense like all the rest she asked looking round with a helpless bewildered air i begin to think that every one in the world is going mad except myself oh, elizabeth if you would only try to remember it is quite true that old promise was made dear and you and i were to be together all our lives but providence has ruled otherwise a foolish mistake of mine divided us and then after a little while you found another lover whose constancy and devotion must have gained your gratitude and esteem if not your love for you married him remember elizabeth you are the wife of lord paulyn you owe affection duty and obedience to him and you are bound to go back to the shelter of his roof if it seems dismal and strained to you while you are so ill dear be assured that fancy will pass away only pray for god's help pray to him to banish all evil fancies evil fancies she cried staring at him with wide open wondering eyes and an expression that was half perplexity half contempt for his persistent folly you are like the rest malcolm mad mad how dare you say that i am married how dare you say that i have ever been false to you oh good heavens have i not thought of you without ceasing since the first night of our engagement that night when we stood by the vicarage gate malcolm and you confessed that you loved me i did wring that confession from you at last and oh how proud it made me as if i had tamed a lion and made him lie down at my feet she was silent for a few moments looking down at the fire with a happy smile placidly happy in that supreme egotism that curious self-concentration which is one of the characteristics of lunacy as if living over again that hour of triumphant love the hour in which she had proved that passion may be stronger than principle even in a good man's breast why do you talk to me of husbands she cried with a little burst of anger there is a man at slognadiac who ill-treated me hurt me with his strong cruel grasp dragged me away from the window when i wanted to escape to you he is not my husband you won't send me back to him will you malcolm oh god you couldn't be so cruel as that if you knew how i watched day after day night after night before this chance came before i could get away from that hateful room they kept my door locked in my own house think of that malcolm the door locked upon me as if i had been a refractory child i watched them to find out where they put the key of the two doors but they wouldn't let me see and it was only to-night for the first time that i cheated them they were both out of the room no one there not even hilda my arch enemy who has tried to poison me oh yes malcolm you will not believe but i have seen it in her face only i have refused to eat and baffled her that way i have refused to touch anything for days till they forced me to swallow their abominable messes with a look of unutterable disgust bending over me with their odious breath and clutching me with their great hot hands oh malcolm starting up from her chair and appealing to him passionately with outstretched hands swear that you will not give me back into their power kill me if you like if you have quite left off loving me if i am no use to the world or you 
kill me malcolm death from your hands would not be painful but don't send me back to that locked room good heavens why do you stand there looking at me like that are you afraid of them afraid of hilda disney afraid of that stony cruel man you call my husband what am i to do he cried not yet able to master even his own thoughts at sea on a stormy ocean of doubt and pity and love and honour to see her thus beautiful even in the utter wreck of reason loving humble confiding the pride that had been her blemished extinguished for ever to see her thus casting herself upon his love appealing to his manhood and yet to feel himself powerless to help her in the smallest degree unable to stand for a moment between her and her sorrow this was an ordeal beyond the worst peril of his wanderings beyond the circle of yelping savages the fire kindled at his feet which he had considered among the possibilities of his career he constrained himself by a supreme effort of his troubled mind to contemplate the situation calmly as if he had been interested only in his priestly character called upon to advise or direct in such an emergency no he exclaimed at last you shall not go back to slogner dyack if i can prevent it she gave a cry of joy a wild passionate cry as of a soul released from purgatory oh thank god she cried oh i knew you would not send me back oh let me stay with you malcolm let me follow you in all your wanderings do you think i fear hardship or famine or weariness where you are let me teach the little children in those savage lands children have always loved me and i them remember how i nursed the children at hawley let me go with you malcolm i will be anything you order me to be a slave to work for those wretched people with a faint shudder as if she had not yet overcome her idea of the general commonness of the missionary order i will endure everything toil danger and death if you let me be with you he did not answer her except with a long look of sorrowful tenderness parting the loose hair gently from her forehead with a protecting touch which was curiously different from the patronising pattings of the faculty contemplating her with a deploring tenderness he could not answer her to reason to attempt to awaken dormant memories seemed useless the doors of her brain had shut up the story of her wedded life it was not in his power to recall her to a sense of her actual position to rend the veil which shut out the realities leaving her soul in a fool's paradise of dreams he had arranged his plan of action meanwhile he rang for the lamp and the honest scottish lassie entering with the lighted moderator beheld with obvious consternation the figure of a lady with pale face and disordered hair clad in a long purple garment slashed and faced with satin a garment such as maggie the housemaid had never looked upon before a garment fastened with cords and tassels which the lady's restless fingers knotted and unknotted again and again while maggie stared at her tell your brother to saddle trim said mr ford in his quietest manner i want a message taken to the railway station at ellensbridge he looked at his watch thoughtfully no it would hardly be too late to send a telegram from that small station you'll no be sending the night mr ford said the girl the station will be shut no it won't maggie tell your brother to get the pony ready this minute and then come back to me for the message he took the lamp to a desk on the other side of the room where he had the blank forms for telegrams and all business appliances and without farther deliberation wrote the following message from malcolm ford dunallen argyleshire to gertrude luttrell hawley devon england your sister lady paulyn is dangerously ill come at once to this place a case of urgent necessity telegraph reply he filled another form with almost the same words addressed to mrs chevenix eaton place south and having delivered these to maggie with strict instructions as to haste and care in the manner of transmitting them he began to consider how soon either of these women could reach that remote spot 
it was too late for mrs chevenix to leave town by the limited mail she could only arrive at dunallen upon the following night just twenty-four hours after the sending of the telegram and during that interval how was he to protect elizabeth from her natural protectors from people who had an unassailable right to the custody of this helpless creature his only hope lay in the chance that they might not guess where she had gone yet he hardly dared hope as much as that when miss disney knew that he was in the neighbourhood and doubtless knew that he had once been elizabeth's betrothed husband his first thought the telegrams being dispatched was to find her a fitting refuge he had friends enough in the cosy little hillside colony friends who in the common acceptation of the phrase would have gone through fire and water to serve him though they had only known him seven weeks he debated for a little while a very little while for moments were precious and he had already lost much time and then decided upon his plan of action two ancient maiden ladies his devoted admirers lived in a snug little villa hardly five minutes walk from the manse friendly scotch bodies upon whose kindness and singleness of heart he could rely with these two ladies he might find the fittest shelter for the forlorn being who had cast herself upon his care lodged safely there she might perhaps escape pursuit for a little while just long enough to bring the friends of her girlhood round her so that she might at least have her sister by her side when she went back to slogner wrap your shawl closely round you lady paulyn he said i am going to take you to a house where you can sleep to-night to friends who'll take care of you friends she cried i have no friends in the world but you oh let me stay here with you oh malcolm you are not going to send me away after all i am not going to send you back to the people you fear as i believe without reason i am going to put you in the charge of two good friends of mine kind old scotch women who will be very good to you i want no one's goodness she exclaimed impatiently why can i not stay here with you it is quite impossible but why because you have a husband and a house of your own she shook her head angrily he's madder than the rest she muttered and i should do very wrong to detain you here i fear that if i did my duty i should at once communicate with your household at slogner dyack oh you'll not do that she cried starting up and clinging to his arm no elizabeth i cannot do that against your wish i will see you placed in safe hands and perhaps to-morrow one of your sisters or your aunt may be here to protect you one of my sisters she repeated dreamily oh i should like to have blanche with me i was always fond of blanche come then the less time we lose the better he went out into the hall she following him and thence to the garden in front of the manse he gave her his arm as they went out into the windy road white in the moonlight but they had scarcely crossed the boundary when she gave a shrill scream and darted back towards the house two women one tall and gaunt looking were standing in the road a few paces from the brougham which seemed to be waiting for them the tall woman advanced to meet mr ford the other ran back to the carriage and exclaimed to some one inside we found her miss disney we found her what do you want asked malcolm his heart sinking with a sickness as of death itself vain had been his hope of putting himself between her and the people to whom she belonged that lady said the female grenadier pointing to elizabeth who stood in the porch watching them lady paulyn it was miss disney told us to come here to look for her yes said hilda who had alighted from the brougham and if you had been honest enough to tell me of lady paulyn's escape at the time it occurred instead of three hours afterwards i should have been here ever so long ago i dare say you remember me mr ford she added turning to malcolm i met you at luncheon one day at hawley vicarage my name is disney i am lord paulyn's cousin i remember you perfectly miss disney i am sorry we should meet again under such lamentable circumstances you have of course perceived lady paulyn's sad condition has she been here long 
oh a little more than an hour i should think what made you suppose she would come here hilda hesitated a little before replying because you are about the only person she knows in this neighbourhood an isolated position for any woman to occupy said malcolm and i should imagine eminently calculated to depress the spirits or even to unsettle the mind lady paulyn had my society and her husband's sir and i do not believe solitude has had anything to do with the melancholy state of her mind she has a strange aversion to returning to slogner dyack said mr forde and a horror of her nurses perhaps a natural feeling in her delirious state now i have friends here two simple-minded kindly old ladies who would be very glad to take care of her for a few days you might remain with her if you pleased and you could by that means withdraw her from a place about which she has such an unhappy feeling he did not want to give her up to them without a struggle yet reason told him any struggle would be useless miss disney's inflexible face looking at him sternly in the moonlight was not the face of a woman to be turned from her own set purpose by an appeal that might be made to her compassion i could not possibly sanction such an extraordinary proceeding she said lord paulyn is away from home and in his absence i feel myself responsible for his wife's safety i cannot forgive the nurses for their shameful neglect this evening there's no being up to the artfulness of them said the tall nurse this evening was the first time the key of that door was ever out of my own keeping owing to my having torn my pocket and not liking to trust it i put that blessed key in the little chiny jar on the mantelpiece will you ask my cousin to come to the carriage mr forde said miss disney with a business-like air we need not lose any more time well you had better come into the house for a little while and talk to her quietly there is no occasion to let her feel she's taken back like a prisoner hilda complied rather unwillingly and mr forde led the way to the porch where elizabeth stood waiting the issue of events you're not going to give me up are you she asked i have no power to detain you then you're a coward she cried passionately is this what men have come to since the age of chivalry when a man would leap among lions to pick up a woman's glove you go among the heathen you brave the rage of savages their tortures their poisoned arrows and their flames why all that they say you have done can be nothing but lies when you're afraid to oppose her pointing contemptuously to miss disney elizabeth he said earnestly trying to pierce the confusion of her mind there are social laws stronger than fire or sword and the law that gives a woman to her husband is the strongest of them all for it is a divine law as well as a social one i dare not come between you and those who have the best right to protect you but i can interfere to redress your wrongs if they are false to their trust i do not stand by unconcerned in this matter wherever you are at slogner dyack as well as in this house i shall be interested in your welfare at hand to give you all the help i can give counsel and consolation as a minister of god's word or advice as a man of the world i have telegraphed to your sisters and your aunt and i feel little doubt that they will be with you to-morrow night a most uncalled-for interference said hilda disdainfully the doctors have forbidden any intercourse between lady paulyn and her relations what do the doctors choose the time when she has most need of familiar friends and old associations to cut her off from them altogether oh, wise doctors miss disney common sense and natural affection suggest a better system of cure for a mind ill at ease Oh, you may pretend to know more than scientific men who have made this malady the study of their lives replied hilda but however that may be i can only tell you that should the miss luttrells be so foolish as to come to lord paulyn's house uninvited by him they will not be allowed to see their sister well we'll see about that when they're here elizabeth stood between them silently 
a vacant look had stolen over the pale melancholy face she uttered no farther remonstrance no farther upbraiding but went with hilda unresistingly apathetic or half unconscious where she was being taken the fitful flame had died out into darkness she was a creature without a mind submissive indifferent to awaken by and by to a sense of her imprisonment and to vain anger and fury like a wild animal that has been netted while it slept end of book three chapter ten book three chapter eleven of strangers and pilgrims by mary elizabeth braddon this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org strangers and pilgrims book three chapter eleven no joy from favourable fortune can overweigh the anguish of this stroke the night that followed was the darkest malcolm ford had ever known till now darker even than that which followed alice fraser's death for are not the dead that are already dead better than the living that are yet alive and to the believer death has no positive horror it is only the anguish of separation a human sorrow a human longing a sharp pain tempered always by that divine hope which makes this earthly life verily a pilgrimage leading to fair worlds beyond it but this death in life called madness this living death which may endure for the length of the longest life is more bitter than the coffin and the grave to know her miserable and helpless in the hands of people she feared linked to a husband she had never even pretended to love was to know her in a state as much worse than death as waking agony is worse than dreamless sleep never until this hour when he looked round his empty room the vacant chair where she had sat the expiring fire into which those lovely eyes had gazed with their far-off dreaming look never until now had he fully realised how he loved her how little the life he had lived and the work he had done in five long years had served to divide him from her how near and dear she was to him still sleep or even the semblance of rest the miserable pretence of going to bed was impossible to him that night he walked down to Slogner Dyack, down to the little bay where the troubled waters broke against the shore with a dismal moaning, where the reflection of the moon was blotted out every now and then by black, wind-driven clouds. It was a dreary night, bleak and wintry, not a favourable season for midnight wanderings or patient vigil beneath the window of a beloved sleeper, yet Malcolm Ford paced at the narrow strip of beach below Lord Paulyn's garden a strip that was covered at high tide until the morning grey that patient watch might be useless was useless no doubt but it was all that he could do the sole service he could render to the woman he loved he saw the lighted windows on the chief upper floor lights that never waned through the weary night and he felt very sure they belonged to the rooms inhabited by elizabeth had a cry of anguish broken from those dear lips it must have pierced the stillness of the night when the wind was low and reached him on his beat sometimes when the shrill blast shrieked in the mountain gorge upon the opposite shore he almost fancied the sound of human anguish was mixed with the voice of the wind it was a sad unsatisfactory vigil but it was better to be there beneath her windows than to be lying sleepless miles away beyond reach of her loudest cry when day came and the first grey threads of smoke crept up from the gothic chimneys he went round to the chief entrance rang the bell and inquired of the sleepy housemaid who answered it if lady paulyn had passed a quiet night ask the head nurse he said as the girl stared at him vaguely and then come back and tell me exactly what she says emphasising his request with a donation the girl departed and returned quickly enough Oh, much the same as usual sir nurse barber says and would you please leave your name give that to miss disney he said handing the girl his card on which he had written the date and seven a m he wanted hilda to know that he was vigilant 
and was not to be deterred from watchfulness by any fear of slander or of lord paulyn's displeasure this done he went back to dunallen went back to the early service in the chapel and to another day's work in the quiet little parish where he had made himself beloved there was nothing more for him to do he thought than to wait till the arrival of the fast train from the south which would not reach the station at ellensbridge till half-past nine o'clock at night even if it were punctual an event not always to be counted as a certainty on a scotch railway he found two telegrams on his study table when he went back to the manse after his morning's work the first from gertrude i leave hawley at nine a m to-day thursday and shall leave london for ellensbridge by the limited mail the second a vague and helpless message from mrs chevenix entreating for detailed information and pleading indifferent health as a reason for not coming to scotland if such a journey might possibly be avoided mrs chevenix had squandered three and sixpence worth of telegraphic communication in the endeavour to represent herself ardently desirous of flying to her beloved niece's sick-bed yet unhappily obliged to remain in eaton place south not till to-morrow therefore could elizabeth's sad eyes be gladdened by the sight of a familiar face not till to-morrow could sisterly arms enfold that poor sufferer for many hours to come malcolm ford must be content to leave her to the tender mercy of hired nurses and hilda disney he could do nothing for her except pray and all his thoughts in this bitter time were prayers for her the railway to ellensbridge was only a loop line and that stern adherence to the hours set down in time-tables which is demanded by southern passengers on main lines was here unknown if a train came in an hour or so after time no one wondered railway officials placidly remarked that she was just a wee bitty late the d and that was all passengers herded meekly together on the narrow platform and gazed up and down the line and saw other trains arrive and depart trains that seemed to have no place in the time-table or watched the leisurely shunting of a string of coal trucks and made no murmur the marvel would have been if a train at ellensbridge had ever come up to time mr ford paced the platform with infinite impatience when the hour had gone by at which the train with passengers from the south should have arrived waiting for the signal that should announce gertrude luttrell's coming there was nothing doing at the station just at this time even the string of empty coal trucks stood idle an unemployed engine on a siding puffed and snorted lazily while the stoker off duty amused himself with the gymnastics of a disreputable-looking monkey the day was wet and depressing that fine straight rain which to the impatient tourist appears sometimes to be the normal atmosphere of scotland filled the air the kind of day in which cockney travellers in the trossachs stare hopelessly at benvenue looming big through the grey mist and think they might almost as well be looking at the dome of st paul's from blackfriars bridge the train came slowly in at last serenely unconscious of being three-quarters of an hour behind time a diminutive train of two carriages and an engine and out of one of the carriages gertrude luttrell looked with a pale anxious face a face which sent a thrill of pain through the heart of malcolm ford for it seemed to him that in this wan and faded countenance he saw a likeness of that altered beauty he had looked upon a little while ago what's the matter with my sister she asked nervously directly she was on the platform oh mr ford am i too late uh, she stopped and burst into tears he led her into the little waiting-room and reassured her there was no immediate danger Oh, thank god she cried with a strange fervour oh mr ford it seems like a dream seeing you here in this strange place it seems like a dream to be here myself i came without loss of an hour i couldn't do any more than that could i elizabeth has not been a good sister to me or indeed to any of us her prosperity has made very little difference to us we went on living our old dull life just the same after her marriage and she did hardly anything to brighten it even long ago before you came to hawley she was always cold and unloving towards me sneered at my humble efforts to do right set herself up against me in the strength of her beauty it is hardly a time for complaints of this kind said mr ford with grave displeasure 
your sister is in great trouble have i not come am i not here to be with her why are you always so hard upon me mr ford just the same after all these years i would do anything in the world for her it's not my fault if her married life is unhappy do not let us waste time in purposeless talk i have a carriage ready to take you to your sister's house i will tell you everything on the way in the carriage he told her the real nature of her sister's illness the ruin that had befallen that bright reckless mind told her his hope of speedy cure in a case where there was no hereditary taint no shattered constitution only the fever and confusion of a mind ill at ease a soul seeking peace where there was no peace he told her of his confidence in the happy influence of a familiar presence of old associations and sisterly affection gertrude was inexpressibly shocked a curious stillness crept over her she left off making vague attempts to explain her own conduct in relation to her sister which had never been called into question by mr ford ceased to make little sidelong attacks upon elizabeth but became mute with the aspect of one upon whom a heavy blow has fallen only when they were near slognadiac did she speak can you say with confidence that you believe she will recover she asked that you do not think she will be mad all her life i can say nothing of the kind he answered sadly i can only say that i try to put my trust in god throughout this trial as in others that have gone before it but this seems harder than the rest they were at slognadiac by this time but here bitter disappointment a disappointment near akin to a despair awaited them for upon gertrude announcing herself as lady paulyn's sister and requesting to be taken straight to the invalid's apartments a vacant-looking flat-faced footman informed her that her ladyship had left slognadiac for the south just four and twenty hours ago what cried mr ford who was standing on the threshold of the door while gertrude stood a little way within staring helplessly at the blank face of the footman do you mean to tell me that lady paulyn was allowed to travel in her state of health oh yes sir the london doctor and one of the nurses went with her they went with her but where oh, to london i believe sir as far as i could make out from what was said where's miss disney let me see miss disney oh miss disney has also left sir then let me see some one who can tell me what all this means this lady is your mistress's sister who has travelled five hundred miles to see her only to be told that she is gone and no one knows where is there any one else in the house who can explain this business the footman shook his head despondingly oh there's coal to the butler sir he said he might know something and there's my lady's own maid let me see her exclaimed mr ford whereupon the footman always with a despondent air ushered them into the library a darksome but splendid apartment which the glasgow manufacturer had furnished with antique carved shelves for books that had never been supplied a room in which literature was represented by a waste paper basket a what-not crammed with stale newspapers a rough guide post and paddock and three or four numbers of bailey's magazine here malcolm ford paced to and fro his soul shaken to its lowest deep while gertrude sat in a huge armchair and cried feebly what had they done with elizabeth what sinister motive had they in this sudden flight what had they done with the helpless creature who had come to him for refuge casting herself upon his pity entreating with heart-piercing accents for shelter and protection and he had refused to shelter her the fear of injuring her in the sight of the world or of widening the breach between her and her husband had been stronger with him than love and pity the anxious desire to do his duty had triumphed over the voice of his heart which had said claim a brother's right to protect her in affliction and defy the world he had done that which he had deemed the only thing possible for him to do he had summoned her nearest of kin the sister who had a right to be by her side at such a time even in defiance of a husband he had done this and behold it was as if he had done nothing for her 
where had they taken her on what dismal journey had she gone with a nurse and a doctor his heart sank as he brooded upon that question there was only one answer that presented itself an answer that was too horrible to think of the door was opened after some delay by mr coulter the butler who had been enjoying the morning in a dressing-gown and slipper condition loitering over a late breakfast and making the most of the family's absence and had just made a hasty toilet in order to come to the front and see what was meant by miss luttrell's unlooked-for appearance on the scene behind him came a young woman with a nervous air and eyelids that were reddened with weeping uh, this young person is lady paulyn's maid sarah todd said the butler blandly i have sent for her to see you sir as i was informed you had expressed a wish to that effect but there is no information she can give you about my lady as i don't know as well as her i'm sorry you should have made such a long journey for nothing ma'am he added turning to miss luttrell but if you'd wrote or telegraphed the trouble might have been avoided i want to know all about this business sir said malcolm ford with his sternest air at whose bidding and in whose custody was lady paulyn removed from this house by the order of her medical adviser sir and under his protection with a nurse also in attendance upon her indeed then lord paulyn was not with his wife oh no sir my lord is in himvenetia what then it was in his absence lady paulyn was removed oh certainly sir oh which the removal of her ladyship had been arranged before his lordship left this house it was his lordship's wish to be away at this time with a natural delicacy of feeling where has lady paulyn been taken to her house in park lane uh, no sir here sarah todd the maid dissolved into tears at which the butler stared sternly at her informing her that the lady and gentleman wanted none of her snivelling oh, pray do not scold her said mr ford i am glad to see that she can feel for her mistress and now perhaps you will be good enough to tell me where lady paulyn has been taken if not to her town house uh, that sir is a question i do not feel myself at liberty to answer you need not stand upon punctilio you can waive the natural delicacy of mind which you no doubt share with your master i can guess the worst you can tell me lady paulyn has been taken to a private madhouse i believe sir it is something in the way of an asylum a strictly private of course and everything upon the footing of a gentleman's house replied the butler softening with a view to a possible donation slipped unobtrusively into his palm presently when he was escorting these visitors back to their carriage can you give me the exact address of the house no sir everything was kept extraordinarily close i heard it was somewhere near london even a nurse didn't know where she was going one of the nurses went with lady paulyn you say which was she the tall woman uh, yes sir and what became of the other uh, she left by the same train sir to go back to her uh, own home and do you know her address no sir nor you turning to the maid no sir but she come from an institution somewhere near the strand you might hear of her there perhaps will you oblige me by writing down the names of both nurses on a slip of paper said mr ford there was an inkstand and portfolio on the table and the girl sat down immediately and wrote two names in a neat schoolgirl hand um, mrs barber that's the tall nurse who went with lady paulyn sir uh, and mrs gurbage uh, that's the one who went home thank you i must try to find mrs gurbage and now tell this lady all you can i'll leave you with her for a few minutes while i talk to mr coulter in the hall tell her how lady paulyn was when she left this place the girl shook her head sorrowfully 
there's very little i can tell sir though i love my lady dearly for she was always a dear good mistress to me a little hasty sometimes but oh so generous and kind but from the time she began to be so ill they wouldn't let me go near her though i know she used to ask for me for i've stood outside her door sometimes for half an hour at a time and listened and heard her call me and then cry ever so pitifully let me have some one with me i know oh, for god's sake send me some one i know the girl remained with miss luttrell while mr ford and the butler went into the hall and waited for them but there was little more to be extracted either from man or maid they only knew that after the fever lady paulyn had gone out of her mind she had suffered an attack of the same kind after her baby's death only not so severe an attack the doctors had come backwards and forwards and it had ended by her ladyship being removed under the care of one of them whose very name the butler had never heard everything was kept so close he repeated and it would have been as much as our places were worth to show any curiosity and thus after a little while they left slogonadiac in darkest ignorance and mr ford took miss luttrell to the manse to give her rest and refreshment before their next move which must be to london the woman he loved better than all things else in this lower world was hidden away from him in a madhouse hard trial of his faith who had made duty his rule of life if he had followed the dictates of his heart that night he might have found her some safe refuge might have saved her from this living grave with a bitter pang he recalled that last contemptuous look which she had flung him when she accused him of cowardice end of book three chapter eleven